It is to you I give the glory. It is to you I give the praise. For you have done so much for me. And I will bless your holy name. It is to you, Holy Father. No one else but you. And I will bless your Good morning and welcome to this morning's worship with the Salvation Army Isle of Wight Corps from wherever you are. Whether it's worshipping in person at the hall this morning, watching this on YouTube from the comfort of your own home or from wherever you are in the world, you're welcome to this morning's meeting. We're going to start by getting your feet tapping with the song Storm the Forts of Darkness.
feel uncomfortable in church, like you just don't belong, or you're not quite connecting? Well, you're not alone. There are many people who feel that way. That's why we've made this instructional video to give you a few simple tips and pointers to show you how to fit in at almost any church. Hey, what's up? <laughs> First of all, silence your cell phone in church. Don't smoke in church. Don't offer cigarettes to children in church. Don't bring a snake to church. If it's a snake handling church, they'll provide the necessary reptiles. Don't play an instrument in church, unless you're a sanctioned member of the worship team. When you pray for someone in church, don't address the prayer to Anubis, Zeus, Gilgamesh, or any other pagan god. Don't practice jujitsu in church. Don't come to church straight from snorkeling. Don't do laundry in church. Don't breed ferrets in church. Don't advertise your business at church, at least not in an obvious way. Don't try to have anyone stoned in church. They don't really do that sort of thing anymore. Don't eat crab legs in church. Unless you brought enough for everyone. See that, that that's wrong. That's don't fact check the pastor's sermon on Wikipedia and then correct him in church. Don't power clean in church. If you follow these basic steps, you really will start to fit in at almost any church. Again! Again! Well, most of you know me, I do like to have a little laugh, whether when I'm leading the meetings. Well, we're now going to have um, a time of prayer, um, which will be helped by a song called The Prayer, which some of you may have seen on TV before, um, especially on X Factor. And then we're going to have a song called My Lighthouse by the Rend Collective. But before that, let's join together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessings on this meeting this morning and for all those who are watching, whether in person or on their TVs. We ask that your spirit is with each and every person who is participating this morning. And we pray, Lord, that the message that you have for all of us will be taken in, in whichever way we see it. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. us where we go and help us to be wise in times when we don't know let this be our prayer when we lose our Guide us with your grace to a place where we'll be safe. I pray we'll find your life. I pray we'll find your life and hold it in our hearts. And hold it in our hearts. Stars go out. Where you are, 
give us faith so we'll be saved. Lead us to a place, guide us with your grace. Give us faith so we'll In my troubled sea, whoa, you are the peace in my troubled sea. In the silence, you won't let go. In the questions, your truth will hold. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea, whoa, you are the peace. In my troubled sea My lighthouse, my lighthouse Shining in the darkness I will follow you oh. My lighthouse, my lighthouse I will trust the promise You will carry me safe to shore from the band and it's a piece of music that's a particular favourite of mine by Norman Beercroft called Songs of Testimony. Then we're going to have a short film where Nick Coke talks about the Max Girl strike in the late 19th century and then we'll have a songster piece uh, with the Auckland songsters with the international staff songsters singing He Sought Me. <laughs> Thank you. 
my favourite object. It's about 120 years old, it's very small, and to be honest, it's not even here. But if it were, it would look a bit like this. A Salvation Army box of matches. What they do have here is a memento from 1894 that tells the story of the Salvation Army match factory. It's a story that starts a few years earlier in the east end of London, not far from where I live. The Humble Match was the technological breakthrough of its day. Instead of relying on cumbersome tinder boxes, the match allowed people to create light and heat in their own home, just from this little box. This is the old Bryanton May match factory in Bow. Today it's some rather nice and quite expensive flats, but back in the 1880s, it would have been the workplace for up to 2,000 women and teenage girls who would have worked here making matches. Demand for matches was very high, and as a result, the matchmaking industry was really flourishing. And there was lots of money to be made in this business, so the people owning the factory were getting quite rich. In contrast to that, the match workers themselves were working in appalling conditions, often for very little pay. And not only in the factory, but in the cottage industry, which were families at home dipping matches into phosphorus and making matches for these big companies. Given these conditions, it was no surprise that many people suffered from ill health but people began to suspect there may be other reasons why they were suffering. Matches at this time were made with a substance called white phosphorus, and it became clear that it was this substance that was leading to a whole raft of health problems for the match workers. And one of the most dangerous things was something called fossy jaw, which was a kind of cancer, which was painful and deadly for the workers. This blue plaque commemorates Annie Besant. She was a social reformer in the 1880s, and she heard about the appalling conditions in the match factory. And she, with them, approached the people in charge of the factory and asked for some changes, but the, they didn't like it, and they asked all the workers to sign something to say the conditions in the factory were good. When one of the workers refused, she was sacked. This led to a strike known as the Match Girl Strike in 1888. The strike lasted for three weeks. As a result, the conditions in the factory were improved slightly, but the white phosphorus continued to do its deadly work. Annie Besant continued to campaign. She argued for the use of red phosphorus, which was much safer white phosphorus. It had been used um, in other places for a long time, but it was very expensive. Where does the Salvation Army fit in? Well, this is the East End. It's the heartland of the Salvation Army. And I imagine most of those match workers would have heard of the Salvation Army. Perhaps some of them were even Salvationists. Whether that's a factor or not, I'm not sure, but what happened next, I think, was a great surprise to a lot of people. In 1891, a short walk up the road, the Salvation Army opened up its very own match factory. And this is where the Salvation Army match factory once stood. It was clean, light, airy, and the girls who worked there had tea breaks. They also got paid a fair wage, a third more than in other factories. And most importantly, the matches were made using the safer and less toxic red phosphorus. It was all a bit of a PR disaster for Bryant and May. And although the Salvation Army matches were initially three times the price of other suppliers, there were many who wanted to support the campaign and were willing to pay that much money for them. The war cry carried adverts. William Booth used the factory as a showcase for social reform and Salvationists were encouraged to worry the grocers until they stocked them. The Salvation Army owned and ran the match factory for 10 years. 
until Bryant and May announced they would no longer be using the dangerous white phosphorus. The campaign had been successful and the Salvation Army sold the factory to Bryant and May. It was another 10 years before white phosphorus was banned in the UK. It's 125 years since the Match Girls strike, but in London there are still people who are fighting for better conditions and fair wages. There are office cleaners, dinner ladies, catering staff, many of whom struggle to bring home enough money to support their families. The Matchbox story has really inspired us here at Stepney Salvation Army to do something. We've been part of the living wage campaign that's been aiming to raise the wages of the poorest workers. It's a start, but there's still a long way to go. This tiny matchbox represents such bold decisions by the Salvation Army at the time. Decisions that ultimately improved the working conditions for many thousands of workers. The matches have themselves lived up to the bold claims on the box. They were far more than mere matches. They really were lights in darkest England.
Bible reading this morning is from Psalm 34. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his holy people, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their cry. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to blot out their name from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the broken-hearted, and saves those who are crushed in spirit. The righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers them, delivers him from them all. He protects all his bones, not one of them will be broken. Evil will slay the wicked. The foes of the righteous will be condemned. The Lord will rescue his servants. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. Songwriters are ever looking for new takes on the ancient story of the life of Jesus Christ. And in Song 138 in the Salvation Army Songbook, the author succeeds magnificently. She takes hold of the classic text in Hebrews, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And then in the song recounts the main events in the life of Jesus before ending with the lines, Oh, I'm glad, so glad to tell you, he is just the same today. The truth that Jesus Christ is the same in heaven as he was on earth is actually quite startling. The Jesus who was prepared to come into this world and be born in Bethlehem, who could perform miracles, who prayed in Gethsemane, who loved us so much that he died for us on the cross, and who rose again from the dead, is just the same today as he ever was. And now, as the song says, he lives for our salvation. This glorious truth is emphasized in the catchy chorus which sticks in the mind. Let it encourage us today, just the same, just the same, he is just the same today. Glad. 
I invite you to join me in a little prayer. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all our minds be acceptable to you, Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So one of the verses of the psalm I read earlier, verse 8, says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. So that text reminds us of an ancient proverb. The proof of the pudding is in the eating. The psalmist's challenge is to make the pragmatic test taste and see. But to many this does not dispose of the questions. If God is good, how could he have made a world where suffering, tyranny, crime, injustice, poverty and disease exist? If God is good, then having made a world like this, must he not be lacking in power? How can God be good? As we deal with this question that arises involuntarily from our hearts, I want to approach the matter from two points of view the negative and the positive. So consider the involuntary question that arises from every heart. How can God be good? To be specific and, not, and yet not get bogged down in the fine spun theories, let us consider three affirmations, each of which may be illustrated by a typical situation in which one would likely raise this question. The fact that God doesn't make life easy is no sign that he's not good. Perhaps something happens to you in the prime of life. You're overtaken by a disease that cripples you or you lose your job, which means the end of a promising career. And in such a situation, you're apt to ask yourself, if God is good, how could he let this happen to me? Why did he not protect me from this tragic thing? Is that your most mature understanding of the goodness of God? That if he were truly good, he would spare you from everything that makes life difficult? Do good parents who love their children always make life easy for them? Would Beethoven's music have been more beautiful if he had not known deafness? Would Milton's poetry have been more moving if he had not been stricken by blindness? President John F. Kennedy in his speech about setting up the Apollo moon project said they were not aiming to put man on the moon because it was easy, but because it was hard. One important point to remember is that God will give us difficult tasks for a number of reasons, but nothing beyond our capabilities. Hard, yes. Impossible, no. The fact that God does not overrule our freedom to destroy ourselves is no proof that he's not good. Suppose you drink too much, drive too fast, and then kill somebody and seriously injure yourself. Then you say, if God is good, why didn't he stop me? Why didn't he prevent this? If individuals choose to abuse their bodies and minds with drugs and alcohol, if we choose to use our freedom to destroy ourselves, it is not God's goodness we need to question, but our own. I used to be questioned by residents in the hostels I've worked in about this very point. If God loves me, why doesn't he stop me from drinking? God isn't the one buying the drinks. Why did God let me lose my home? God didn't spend the rent money on alcohol. The fact that God does not always act in a way we can understand is no indication that he's not good. Let's take ourselves back to an era in many of our lives that many of us may have experienced. Suppose you're young, the girl or boy of your dreams deserts you for another. This seems to be the end of everything. A year later you meet the person who is to become your wife or husband. They are God's chosen one for you. And you begin a life that is full, not only of romance, but of happiness and joy and solid achievement. One day you realise that you are now thanking God for the very thing that you blamed him for a year earlier. Because God's ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts, 
things that seem to seem at the time to be bad usually turn out for our good. So now we turn from the negative to the positive viewpoint. Consider a way to an answer, the Bible's way. The psalmist's imperative is taste and see that the Lord is good. So three thoughts stem out from these words. This is a challenge to the unbeliever, the doubter. The psalmist rejoices in this. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. I want you to note that the psalmist says the angel and not an angel of the Lord. This is a typical Old Testament reference to Christ. By reason of this protection over his saints arises the summons to test the graciousness of God. Tasting stands before seeing, for spiritual experience leads to spiritual perception. We cannot see the beauty of a stained glass window if we remain outside the building. A sinner cannot know the grace, mercy and peace of God if he or she stays outside of Christ in unbelief. This is the testimony of the believer. This is not the only saint's challenge to the unbeliever, or it is his testimony or her testimony as well. The only true knowledge comes from experience, taste and see. Now, I don't know whether any of you have ever had a fizzy drink called Cocopina. Now, it's made from coconut and pineapple, and I'll be honest, I haven't been able to see it in the shops for years. Now, if you've never had it before, it won't matter how much I go on about how wonderful it tastes and how refreshing it is ice cold on a hot summer's day. Until you've tasted it yourself, you won't have a true knowledge of it. Jesus invited the two disciples who inquired where he was staying come and you will see. When Nathaniel would have raised questions about Philip's testimony, Philip didn't argue. He challenged him to take the pragmatic test. Come and see. Come and see what he has done for others. Come and see what Christianity has done. Inquire, analyse and look at what has been accomplished. It is no sin to inquire. It is the only way to know. It's also the ultimate ground of assurance. To taste and see is the only way we may know for ourselves. Try it. Experience the grace of God for yourself. Some would say, first I must know, then I will do. Actually, the reverse is true. First you must do, and then you will know. Christianity begins as an experiment, and it ends as an experience. Horatius Bonar gave his testimony of his experience with Christ in a beautiful hymn, I Heard the Voice of Jesus Say. Part of it goes like this, I heard the voice of Jesus say, Behold, I freely give, the living water, thirsty one, stoop down and drink and live. I came to Jesus and I drank of that life-giving stream. My thirst was quenched, my soul revived. And now I live in him. If you have not had the experience or the true knowledge of what it is like to walk with Jesus, then come and see. Taste and see. Find out for yourselves what we rattle along about or what we rattle on about with the Salvation Army. For our closing song, we're going to have an experience from the Royal Albert Hall, and we'll sing together Shine, Jesus Shine. 